Welcome to the Fun de Stratocaster story, introducing a pre-production model named Miss Daisy. I'm Jean-Pierre Danel. You may notice that I'm French, so I'm going to try to do my best with my English. I hope you get everything that I say. We're going to, of course, talk about the Fender Stratocaster, uh, the story of the guitar, how it came to life, uh, who are the guys behind the concept and the production of the guitar, and how it uh, had a big influence on the uh, pop music and the pop culture. So let's, let's talk about the Strat in details. In fact, in the 1920s, some guys already tried to put some pickups in their jazz guitars to, to get a louder sound, because in those years, uh, the guitar were not leading instruments. In fact, if you hear the jazz bands, you couldn't hear the guitar very well. So the only way to get a lead guitarist was to do what Django Reinhardt was doing, meaning that he was playing only with guitar and a double bass, but no drums, no horn, nothing like that. And in a big orchestra, such as Glenn Miller, let's say, you had horns, drums, etc., and you couldn't hear a guitar, so there was no need for a guitarist at all. So in the 20s, those guys tried to have a louder sound, but it didn't work very well. Later in the 30s, um, companies such as Rickenbacker tried to get electric guitar or so-called electric guitars and there was a guy named Doc Kaufman who tried to do some kind of an electric guitar plugged into an amp. Well that was a try for a guitar. The thing was that nothing was working properly. A bit later on a guy named Paul Bixby that was uh, a guitar player, an engineer, tried to have a prototype of a new concept of guitars named solid body guitars, meaning that the body was like a plank of wood. Uh, that was supposed to allow a, a louder sound, uh, but that was only a prototype. Then there was a guy named Les Paul, who was famous as a guitar player, a composer, and also an engineer. He invented the multi-track recording. And Les Paul had an idea uh, to improve uh, those kind of solid body guitars. And he did a prototype that he named the Log. And he took the Log to Gibson, but Gibson rejected his offer. And so the Log stayed uh, without any production at all. In the 40s in California, there was a guy named Leo Fender. And Leo Fender was working on sound systems for local bands, and he was also working on amps. Uh, he, he used to, to prepare sound system for guitar players especially, so he designed his first amps in the 40s. In 1946, he found a company, first with Doc Kaufman and later on, on his own. The company was named Fender Musical Instruments. And Leo Fender wasn't a musician at all, although he had some lessons as he was a teenager of piano and saxophone, he never played a guitar. But he had a lot of local guitar players asking for advice, repairs and stuff like that. So little by little, Leo Fender was more involved into the guitar world. And in the late 40s, he started to think about this new concept that was floating around, a solid body guitar. He didn't invent the solid body guitar at all, but he was inspired by the prototypes around. And he was the first guy, in fact, to have the idea to put that on the production line. So what Leo Fender did was that he tried to improve the prototypes that were already existing and to make that reliable and easy to, to put on a production line. So his first attempt was a guitar that was named a Fender Broadcaster. It was soon to change its name because Broadcaster was a registered trademark for Gretsch. They had a drum kit called the Broadcaster. So Leo Fender changed the name for a very 
short period of time. The guitar didn't bear any name, so it is known now as the Fender Nocaster. And then it became the Telecaster. So we're gonna see a bit what it was like and try to understand how this Telecaster led to the Stratocaster that we now know. So let's look at what a Telecaster looks like. It's not really an old vintage one from the 50s, but it looks pretty much the same. Um, in fact, the Telecaster was just a plank of wood and it wasn't a great hit when uh, Fender released the guitar. Uh, there's only a few copies, uh, like a few hundreds. Uh, it was designed for country players and it was a very simple guitar. The idea of Leo Fender was to make an affordable guitar that was uh, more easy to build than a Gibson. So there's no luxury on the guitar, no decoration, no design. And the neck is not glued on the body like on the Gibsons, but it's uh, put on the body with some screws. And that's very practical and much cheaper to build. So at first, the necks were maple necks, but we're gonna see that later. Anyway, the guitar was quite simple, two pickups, and nothing else in fact. It was quite a brilliant guitar and it's still a big hit today but it started a bit slowly. Nevertheless when Gibson saw that and saw that Fender catch the attention of local players, country players and later on players uh, in the whole country, they just called back uh, Les Paul and said well after all your log, your idea of a solid body guitar might be quite interesting and Gibson finally launched the Les Paul guitar. So in a way, Leo Fender is a bit responsible for the birth of what was to be his biggest concurrent, the Les Paul Gibson guitar, which is a bit funny to see after all. Anyway, this guitar was the first Fender uh, instrument on production line. And soon after it, it took off, Leo Fender thought that he had to improve this. So he worked on another idea, which was a bass guitar, an electric bass guitar, that we was to name the Precision Bass. The Precision Bass was a very clever idea. It was a bass guitar. In fact, in those years, all the rhythm and blues, blues and rock players were using um, double bass. And in fact, the rock and roll wasn't born yet, but they needed a louder sound. So Leo Fender had the idea to design a bass guitar uh, based on this solid body notion. And he put some frets on the board, like on the guitar. And so he gave the name to the bass because the precision was there, thanks to the frets. And after that, after this bass guitar, that looked a bit like the Stratocaster, we're gonna see that a bit later on. Um, he felt the need to improve, as I said, the guitar line of Fender. So those instruments, the Telecaster and the Precision Bass, led to what we know as the Fender Stratocaster. We're going to see how it was designed and how it came to life and how it hit all the musical world uh, to the big surprise of everyone because the guitar was designed for country players and in fact it was involved in a much bigger uh, music movement all around the world. That was rock and roll. We're gonna leave the Telecaster and focus on the Stratocaster. So join me inside because it's freezing cold over here. It's warmer here. Following the growing success of the Telecaster, Fender was now an important company in the mid 50s. Um, Leo was focusing on the sales of his steel guitars, very appreciated by the local players, the country players. He also had some success with the amps. The twin amp was very successful, very appreciated by the guitar players. He also had some success with the precision basses, as we said. So Leo thought that it was time for Fender to have a new top of the line guitar, uh, some improvement for the Telecaster. He had Donald Rundle in charge of the commercial side of the company. And he also worked with two guys that were to become very important in the Stratocaster development. George Fullerton was one of them and Freddie Tavares, a session player, was also very involved in, in the Stratocaster design and development. The idea of Leo Fender was to develop a new guitar with some new features, some innovations. He thought that a third pickup would be a very good idea, that it would be very attractive from 
a commercial point of view. He also had the desire to develop a reliable vibrato system that he called tremolo, but in fact it's a vibrato thing. The vibrato device was already existing. Paul Bixby had made one, but not that reliable. The guitar didn't stay in tune that much. So the idea for Fender was to work on a new system, a completely different approach to the tremolo vibrato system. So many months of 1953 were spent working on this new vibrato device. Also, Leo wanted this new guitar to be tried by players because he wasn't a guitar player himself. So the idea was to talk to local players and use them as guinea pigs. So by the very, very end of 1953, some guys around, such as Rex Gallion, tried the guitar. It was a prototype, more or less, at that time. They tried the guitar and had some comments on it. And one of those comments was that the Telecaster wasn't very comfortable. Um, the edges of the body were a bit, uh, you know, if you had some belly, or, it hurt. It hurts. So the idea was to design the Strat body to make it more comfortable. So that was a very important feature. And also George Fullerton had some idea about how the guitar should be plugged in. So many ideas came around and the three of them developed in fact the Stratocaster concept. And early in 1954 the guitar was ready to be launched. The idea was to try the model as it was finished by then, by some players again. So Leo gave away some guitars, he gave a very unusual Fiesta Red guitar to a rhythm and blues player named Pee Wee Creighton. He also gave some guitars around and they started to show the guitars to shops and players. The NAM show, the big national show for music and instruments in the US, uh, was during August 1954. So they built a few guitar, a few guitars, and those guitars are pre-production models. In fact, Forrest White, which was uh, the head of the Fender factory back in the mid 50s, explained that in his book, his memories book, he said that any Stratocaster that was built before October the 13th, 1954, was indeed. Um, a pre-production model. So what is a pre-production model? It's a guitar that is not really different than the production line that was soon to start. But those guitars were guitars that were built before the production started. So they were demonstration guitars. But um, Fender uh, wasn't very successful in presenting those guitars to customers and shops. In fact, one of the Fender guys went to New York City to present this new model to come, the Stratocaster. And when he showed the guitar to the New York dealer, the guy said, well, in fact, I could trade that for my son's electric train toy, but I wouldn't pay a dollar for that. The guitar was so weird. The, the look of it was very unusual. It looked like a UFO or something. So, in fact, no one wanted this guitar. It was too unusual. There were a lot of a lot of innovations, the look was really weird. And the Telecaster was nicknamed a plank of wood. That one was no different, just more weird, in fact. So it wasn't a, an, an easy start. So Fender built only a very few pre-production molds. We think that it's, it's around 60, 70 guitars. It's not exactly sure how many of those were built, but there are not many. Anyway, those guitars in the end, uh, were sold uh, because they were put in some shops and in the end they were sold but in October 1954 on the 13th Fender got the very first orders for the Stratocaster after the NAMM show. Um, they had two orders in fact of 100 guitars each so on October the 13th the Stratocaster was put on production officially with 200 guitars which is very few if you compare to the almost two million guitars that had been sold since 1954. So they started with those 200 guitars and the Stratocaster was officially born. So we're going to meet now 
one of those rare and even scarce pre-production models, my dear and lovely Miss Daisy, a guitar that was built in June and July 1954. I'm going to present you a guitar, introduce you Miss Daisy, and explain you how it was born and how those 60 or maybe 70 guitars were to start what became an icon for pop culture. Follow me, we're going to meet Miss Daisy. The director wants me to change all the time, we're going to look like a fashion show. In fact, we're not a fashion show, we're not a blockbuster production, but when it comes to big, big moment in the program, like introducing Miss Daisy, then we, we can use some magic tricks. Look at that. Please bring me Miss Daisy. Look at that. This is not Miss Daisy. Please bring me the real deal. I'm going to introduce you to the real, the one and only, Miss Daisy, the pre-production 1954 strap. Thank you. Here it is. Et voilà. Here is Miss Daisy. June, July 1954, Fender Stratocaster. I'm gonna tell you more about this lovely, lovely guitar. Here is Miss Daisy, as we said, a 1954 pre-production Stratocaster. In fact, this particular guitar was built in June 1954 for the neck. It was signed by Tadio Gomez, the famous crafter for Fender at the time. The body was finished in July 1954, exactly on July 17th, the 17th. Most of those 1954 Strat have a one-piece body, which is very good for the sound. And also, it's an ash body, not an alder body, like later on. In fact, those early Strats uh, were a bit more expensive. Um, Fender later changed for alder body because, you know, those one-piece ash body were a bit expensive. Uh, still, they are nice, the, the body is nicely figured and the sound is pretty good. So, this guitar has all the specifications that we know about the Strat, you know, the tremolo, the three pickups, uh, maple neck at that time, and the two-tone sunburst, as I said.
So this guitar seems very common now, but in those years it was a very, very new approach to um, a musical instrument, especially for a guitar, you know, this kind of plank of wood like the telly was. Now we're going to compare Miss Daisy to later Stratocaster's model. Follow me. The Strat is of course famous for its deep curves. On the early models, the curve of the body were quite deep. It's, it makes a very comfortable guitar. But the early curves like this were to change in the mid 70s because Fender used different kind of woods and the curves were not that deep. On this 1979 anniversary Stratocaster, as you can see, the curves are not deep as on the early models. Today they came back to the early curves. In the early models, the standard finish was a two-tone sunburst, like this. This one is a bit amber, some are more yellowish on the 1954 production strats. Um, on Miss Daisy, you have a nice example of this amber finish. On Lady Rose, it's a bit different. This finish is slightly different, uh, mainly the figures on the wood are quite different than on Miss Daisy, but those two guitars uh, have an ash body much more figured than the other body that they used later on. On this uh, ratio of the 1954 model, this guitar is from Japan back in the, in the 80s. You can see they used an older body in two different pieces and of course the grain of the wood is very, very different. From 1956 onwards, Fender offered uh, an option which was a blonde color, but there was no official custom color apart special orders and prototypes until 1958. Then the standard finish was a three-tone sunburst with some red in it. Then they start to have some custom colors. Black, which was in fact available through special orders before. Fiesta red, like on this Hank Marvin model. Different kinds of blue, like Daphne blue or Lake Placid blue. Candy apple red, and many other colors. <laughs>
course, some people customized their guitar. George Harrison was famous for his rocky Stratocaster, which was in fact a Daphne Blue Strat that he painted with psychedelic colors. In the 70s, Fender offered a natural color like this, which is a bit different than the blonde color they used in the 50s and 60s. And this one is an ash body, which is quite unusual for the 70s guitar and offers quite a nice kind of wood. In the 70s, Fender also offered a new black and black strap. In the early 80s, Fender offered what they call ratio guitars. Those strats were copies of the 1957 and 1962 models. Uh, they were pretty close uh, to the original. Um, the dots here are not exactly in the right position. The curves of the bodies were not exactly the same, and the curves on the headstock were not exactly the same. Still, this is a Fiesta Red that looks pretty uh, close to the original one. On this 1956 model, the color is a bit different, but still the ratios are pretty close and pretty good guitars. In the 80s, Fender started to offer a signature model. The first one was the Eric Clapton model with special pickups, we're gonna talk about that. That one was a Ferrari red model, an unusual color for Fender. There were three colors for the Clapton model, the gray one as well, and a green one.
the 90s, the Sweat Plus Deluxe also offered another kind of color, a kind of pinky red, let's say. This Japanese fender offered a kind of metallic purple. This limited edition for Japan only had a quite an unusual color with a beautiful neck as well. A bit later on, Fender offered this 50th anniversary edition with a shoreline gold like in the 50s and an anodized pigard. The custom shop also offered very special designs, such, such as uh, aluminum bodies like this. Not very elegant in my opinion. This is more original, this plateau edition was limited to a few dozens of instruments. This one is a reminder of a one-off pace slipping Stratocaster from the 70s. This one is quite psychedelic as well. Yeah. 
in the recent years, Fender even produced a 12-string Stratocaster. offers cheaper Stratocasters, sometimes in quite original looks. Or the same one in black. But usually Squire offers re-edition of uh, usual Stratocasters models, such as this one. <laughs> Through special orders, the custom shop can also make for you any kind of guitar. Fender made that one for me, which is a reminder of David Gilmour's. Uh, famous Stratocaster, a very good guitar. They also built this one for me, quite original. They also made that one for me, which is a very good guitar as well, and they uh, put a special feature on it. The serial number is 0001, like on Dave Gilmour's guitar again. <laughs> From 1954 to 1959, the strap was only offered with a mapper neck, like this. Those early necks were signed by Taddy Gomez, a crafter for Fender. After mid-1959, the strap was offered only with a rosewood neck, like this. And this option was the only one available through the 60s as well. More recently, Fender offered different kind of woods for the necks, and even offered very original designs. Of course, the strap is also famous for its three pickup. They didn't change too much over the years. But um, there were some different options, as we're going to see. But Fender put a three selection switch here to choose through the pickups. Later on in 1977, they put a five position switch, uh, which was in fact not very new because lots of guitarists used five position instead of the three official ones. By the end of the 80s, Fender offered those lay sensors pickups on the Clapton model. And then the custom shop made a lot of new pickups, like reissues from 1957, 1954, special even humbucker pickups. Very, very different kind of sound were then available on a Strat. The Deluxe Strat offered different variations of the lace sensors pickup. In fact, they, they have different colors, uh, gold, red, and blue, for different sound. Fender also offered different variations from the Strat, with different kinds of looks and pickups. On this one, you can even get a humbucker pickup. In the early 50s, the head of the Stratocaster had a small size, uh, one round string guide, and what they call a spaghetti logo. 
and no trace rod there. During 1956, they changed the string guy for a butterfly one. They kept it in the 60s. After 1965, Fender put a larger headstock and a different logo. Later on, they added a trust rod like we can see here. This is a long one. And later on, they put a short one and a second string guide. After the early 80s, with the ratio models, Fender came back to the small headstock. On the Deluxe Strat, Fender offered a different nut in metal and also different tuners, such as those spurzel ones. On the signatures model, you could find the signature of the artist over here, like Eric Clapton there, Hank Marvin here. But on this Eric Johnson signatures model, there's no signature over here. On a few very, very early strats of April and May 1954, the serial number was printed on the tremolo plate on the back of the guitar. Then Fender switched to this plate, metal plate, like on Miss Daisy, 0585 was the serial number. As I said, the serial numbers had no chronological or logical sequence. Uh, on this original plate, or well, it's supposed to be original, I'm not exactly sure, but it bears the number 0010. It's supposed to be one of the very first Stratocasters. After October 1954, Fender switched to uh, the numbers uh, of the Telecaster and the Precision Bass. So the numbers on the back of the 54 Strat were much higher. 6760. This guitar is from November and December 1954. On La Marquise, my 1956 Strat, the serial number is 11218. In the 60s, Fender started to print an F for Fender logo on the plate. After 1971, the form of the plate changed with only three screws instead of four. There was an exception though. This 1979 anniversary Stratocaster has the usual plate with some special mention for the 25th anniversary of the Stratocaster. The custom shop models have the usual plate with some special mentions on it. So here is Miss Daisy with its little sisters around, uh, the old 1955 Fender twin amp and the old case. So it's difficult to have you hear the sound of Miss Daisy on the video. Uh, still it's Sounds pretty good, it's a pretty good guitar. Uh, you can hear it through the program uh, with some music. Well, well, I can show you a few things like... Thank mm -hmm. you. 
Over the last 60 years, the Swat has been on the top of the instrument sales on the guitar market. It's quite amazing to see that a guitar that was first built in 1954 is still now ruling the game all over the world. Quite amazing. The guitar has been used by most of all the great players. Buddy Holly, Hank Marvin, Eric Clapton, Jimi Hendrix, Jeff Beck, many, many great, great musicians use the Strat and are still using it. It's an icon. So it's really, really a pleasure to play on such a guitar. And especially I'm lucky to play on Miss Daisy, which is really a great instrument. I had some interesting story with, with, with the guitar. In fact, when I got Miss Daisy a few years ago, a Fender magazine, uh, did an article about the guitar. It was great to see uh, the Fender official uh, luthier in Paris uh, trying the guitar and writing in the Fender magazine that it was certainly one of the best two electric guitars he ever heard. That was quite flattering for Miss Daisy. I was very happy for that. Um, now you can buy a full-scale poster of Miss Daisy. If you walk around in France, let's say, by uh, the museum Le Louvre Gallery, you can buy the full-size poster of Miss Daisy if you want to put it on your walls. Quite, quite funny to see that. I was also amazed to see Miss Daisy in a Facebook application. I think it's called Famous Guitars or something. It was funny to see the guitar there. And um, I was lucky enough to record some duets for several of my albums with guitar greats. Hank Marvin tried the guitar and was absolutely amazed by, by Miss Daisy. <laughs> So I recorded a duet with uh, Albert Lee in Iber Road Studios in London and Albert was really, really very happy to, to meet Miss Daisy and was really impressed with the guitar. And so were other guys like Scott Henderson, many French great players. In 2008 I paid tribute to Miss Daisy, I wrote a little tune called The Pink Side of Miss Daisy that was also a tribute to Pink Floyd in fact. And uh, I was uh, lucky enough to have the single to the top 10 charts and I was very happy to see that uh, Miss Daisy became a bit popular, I received emails very often asking for news from his daisy or a photo or whatever. So it's quite lovely. So I hope you had uh, as much uh, fun and I hope to see you soon. Bye bye.